girl, you've got questions. Questions about your body and how to feel good in it, about your hormones and how to keep them in check. Questions about your sex life and your whole health. Can you imagine having a best girlfriend who was also a triple board certified OBGYN? A girlfriend doctor you could call and ask or tell her anything. Someone who could show you how to live any stage of life before, during, or after menopause in a big, bold, and beautiful way. Well, friends, I'm your girlfriend doctor. I believe you were meant to flourish and shine, to embrace life and awaken to all its possibilities. Let's get there together. Welcome to our show. Welcome back to The Girlfriend Doctor. I am thrilled to be here with you all again today. I am loving our shows. I'm loving our interactions. I'm loving your questions. And I wanna thank you for writing in. We have been getting so many questions about breast health. You know, October is always Breast Health Awareness Month, as I like to call it. And we focused on breast health. In our first episode, we had a great deep dive conversation with Dr. Veronique Dossonnier who is the breast cancer conqueror, had conquered breast cancer and even wrote a book about it. I mean, great conversation, including what you need to know about your breast self-exam. So after that, our last episode, we talked about droopy breast and what do we need to do about it? How can we keep our breast healthy? What are proactive exercises we can do? And what about, you know, sexy, breast wear, whether we've had breast surgery, mastectomy or not. And we have received so many questions from our audience about breast health. And especially this question has come up over and over again. So let's go to our caller. Hello, Dr. Anna Quebec. I'm a huge fan of the show. Thank you so much for this topic because uh, I've had my breast implants for over a decade now. I'm 46 years old and I'm wondering, could my implants be making me sick? Um, I've heard some perhaps myths that they uh, need to be changed out every every decade or so, and I'm, I'm about at that mark. So I'm just wondering, could they be making me sick? Could my implants be making me sick? Thank you so much. It's such an important question, and you're not alone in that question wondering, oh my gosh, you know, before all this issue with breast implant illness has come up, I've had breast implants, and now what do I do about it? What's, what do I believe? What don't I believe? So we're going to do a deep dive into breast reconstruction, implant, and explant. I've got amazing guests to share with you today. I also have a special mission project, and this is thebreasties.org. It is a sisterhood for women who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer, all ages, and a really important topic near and dear to my heart. So I look forward to sharing her expertise with you as well. So let's get started, shall we? Here we go, to the couch. <laughs> well, welcome. I am on the couch to talk with one of my dearest girlfriends, Dr. Karen Dunstan. Her and I go way back to our early OBGYN practices in Southeast Georgia and have just run this amazing parallel route in our lives. She is now a um, amazing, integrative, internationally renowned OBGYN doing online health and wellness, focusing right now in the midst of her menopause summit. So, hey, Karen, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you, Anna? So glad to be here. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. You know, the, today's discussion, we've been talking about breast health and breast cancer recovery and implants and explants. And you have shared your personal journey with me on this topic. And I would love for you, and I really thank you for sharing it with our audience. This having this conversation is important. So talking about your experience with breast implant illness. Yeah, it really is important. Um, you know, I came to breast implants late in life after I lost 100 pounds. I was previously a C, and I know there's no such thing in your world as TMI, so I just tell it like it is. I was previously a C cup, but then I lost 100 pounds, and I was down to an A um, just because I had had actually a breast reduction when I was obese because I had so much neck and shoulder and back pain, didn't know at that time that I had fibromyalgia, but I did. Then after I healed myself from that and I lost all that weight, I had no breasts and I didn't feel like myself. And so I had implants placed, big mistake. 
I did okay for a while, but then at some point I started having health problems and my health had been the best of my life. And so when I did, I consulted an environmental doctor, actually Dr. Will, William Ray right there in Dallas. And he actually immediately said, I think it's the implants. And he tested me for sensitivity to silicone. And so kind of right there is when I made the decision to have them out. So, and I know you, I've known you through this journey. I know you're at your peak of your health. I mean, running a practice and a med spa and all of these great things you're, you're doing to help women and, and um, families. And then all of a sudden it was like one illness after the other. And it was chemical sensitivities you were experiencing, you know, mm -hmm. the brain fog issues. And it was like, okay, you know, I'm almost a feeling of disorientation. Would you agree? Yeah, it was, you know, it was hard to decipher which was the breast implants and which was the environment because I actually started working in a building that was new and had a lot of varnish and VOCs in it. And so we thought it was completely the building that made me sick. So the symptoms I was having was swelling in my hands and a disorientation, lack of balance, pain in the body, fatigue. Um, and then from the building, I think a lot of upper respiratory respiratory symptoms, nasal drainage, things like that. And so that's when I went to Dr. Ray, who really is one of the fathers of environmental medicine. And he said, yeah, it's the building is the acute issue, but also the low burning, slow burning issue is this silicone that's in your body um, that really is it, even though it's encapsulated, the capsule itself is made of silicone and it does seep out into the tissues and cause a reaction. Um, so the symptoms, you know, were pretty classic for breast implant illness, a lot of them, and then superimposed on top was this building illness. So I kind of had two issues going on. And so when he tested you for silicone, was that a blood test? How did he test you? Great question. So he did skin testing for various environmental allergens by injecting them under the skin and then they would measure the re reaction over time. And so with the silicone, yeah, I had big reactions to some building things like um, the VOCs from the varni varnish and then also from the silicone, um, I had a reaction. And that's when he said, you know, I really think this is a big part of it. And I actually didn't have an explanation for probably about a year till a year after that um, to really work on detoxing my body to get all of the VOCs out and formaldehyde from the building. Uh, and so it was about a year later that I had it. And then when you had the explant surgery, talk about that journey and what that was like and what did they find when they remove your breast implants? Sure, so it's interesting, you know, a lot of plastic surgeons aren't really on board, shall we say, with this fact that silicone implants cause health problems, even though it's documented by the FDA that there's an increase in certain type of lymphoma and autoimmune disorders and connective tissue disorders. And in many studies that put them in that I wanted them out. He looked at me and said, well, why do you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? And so I explained to him about the environmental problems and he kind of rolled his eyes and said, yeah, well, whatever, I'll take them out if you want me to, uh, which was kind of interesting because I think that women who don't necessarily uh, haven't seen an environmental doctor and nobody's really confirmed that this is what's going on and this could be the cause of your problems and don't have that validation and affirmation behind them, their plastic surgeon might just dismiss them and convince them that it's not a part of the problem. So he said, fine. I'll take them out, but I don't really think that's the problem is what he said. Um, and so uh, it, it's a pretty simple procedure to have them removed. And just like having them placed, it's not the surgery of the placement that's the risk. It's actually that you're putting this foreign toxic body in your body. That's the risk. Um, and it increases the longer you've had the implants. Um, so the surgery wasn't that bad, you know, some bruising um, and discomfort, uh, but that probably only lasted a few weeks. Uh, and then it's interesting, though, I really did notice within a few weeks differences, especially in the brain fog and the fatigue and that 
balance issue I was having and the swelling that I was having. So, and it's, it's, you know, I know some people when they have explantation, they notice it immediately, they feel better. Like almost like taking the trash that's been sitting in your house and getting it out of your house. Mine wasn't immediately it took a few weeks and then it gradually and gradually improved and improved and improved over months. So I really do think that it was the best decision. Awesome. I want to thank you for sharing that with us because I know I've, I see you at your peak right now. So, you know, yeah. you've got you've done a lot of work and you're just, you know, a detective. We say the Nancy Drew. <laughs> Catch your Nancy Drew on always detective looking for those root causes and and walking your talk. So I want to thank you for all that you share and all that you do and all that you give the world. And so if a woman's wondering whether or not they have this, you know, this implant illness and where, where do you recommend testing? Who do you, what resource do you recommend them going to? I think consulting with an environmental physician is the best option because they're really trained in the science of what in your environment is making your body toxic. And that includes the environment inside your skin. Um, and Dr. Ray has since passed away, unfortunately, but the, he does have doctors at his practice uh, who consult. And there's an organization of environmental doctors that can really look at this and they can test you for sensitivity to silicone and see how you react. Uh, so that would be what I would recommend, but also most functional medicine, metabolic specialists like I'm trained in um, can know that this is a problem. I had a patient come to me, um, she was about 28 and she had had breast implants placed a few years prior and she was having all kinds of symptoms like we're talking about. So she was having pain, she was having these chronic headaches. Her memory really had decreased her short-term memory, even in her 20s. Um, and she had been from doctor to doctor to doctor, which is the common uh, symptom that you find in addition to the breast implant illness symptoms, people say, I've been from doctor to doctor to doctor. And they tell me that they can't find anything wrong. Nothing's wrong because this isn't going to show up on your regular lab test, your CBC, your blood counts, your chem panels, right? It takes a lot until those are actually going to be disrupted. Uh, and so they'd say, you're fine. And she'd say, well, I'm not fine. I'm 28. I feel like I'm 60. She was having joint pain also and muscle pain. And so she really wasn't getting answers. And then she found me and on our first interview together, I said to her, she told her she had breast implants. I'm like, well, that's where we got to look first. So it really should be the first place that any doctor looks. And so if you're having symptoms that you think could be due to implant illness, you need to tell your doctor that you have implants right away because I find that some women don't offer that information on the initial health history for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they consider it cosmetic. It's not part of their medical history, but it really is and it's that important. And then if they don't talk to you about breast implant illness, then you need to find a doctor who knows about it. So actually this young woman, 28, that was one of the first things we looked at and addressed and she had them out. And her, she was one who her, her symptoms decreased immediately after her surgery. So, you know, it's a shame that she had to go on that long journey of seeking uh, because really the information is in the literature literature and there's awareness of it with the FDA. And so most doctors should be versed in this. Unfortunately, they're not. Yeah, no, this is a, why we're bringing it to awareness. So that just to ask the question, well, what if, or if it could be, what do we need to do to address it? And how do we get to the bottom of it so that we can heal and move on? Right. And I think too, women have a tremendous amount of intuition. So if you're thinking about it, let's, you know, get it checked. Let's get it checked and see. And our plastic surgeon, uh, Dr. Rachel, who was just on recently, she said, you know, part of routine surveillance with breast implants is ultrasound every three years, even to look with ultrasound. I think that's a great step in the right direction to say, okay, it's not just, you know, once and done, right? In and done. We yeah. need to, it's like maintenance, like anything else. 
Karen, it's great being with you. Thank you for spending time with me this morning and having this having this discussion. That's so important to have. I know you've got a busy schedule and you've got your your menopause summit going strong. So yes. um, thank you. And we'll we'll chat more later. I look forward yes. to it. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome back. I'm so excited to have Sierra Haley. She is a 26 year old stage three triple negative breast cancer survivor. Yes, you heard that right. 26 years old. She works as a registered nurse in Dallas, Texas, and she's a co-ambassador of the local Dallas Fort Worth chapter of an amazing organization called the Breasties, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting those affected by breast and other reproductive cancers through community and friendship and openness, right? So we're having a great conversation. Welcome, Sierra. Welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anna. It's great to be here. Well, I want to thank you for coming and also for being so open. I think that's what you said. You joined the Breasties because people aren't afraid to talk about anything. Yes. So when you're diagnosed with breast cancer so young, um, it's just you you ultimately feel alone. And the mission of the Breasties is that no one feels alone. So um, when I discovered them, I met someone, another uh, young breast cancer survivor in the treatment center where I was at. And um, through her, through Instagram, I um, found the Breasties. And so it's been great. Um, you know, they're willing to talk about the things that people don't want to talk about, you know, sexual health, which is one of your specialties. Um, you know, just the things that typical 26 year olds don't go through um, that you can't talk to your friends about. You can and you can lean on them for support. But um, the breasties is to, meant to be your best friend. And so it's a combination of the word breast and, and best friend. So it's the breasties. So um, kind of like your play on the girlfriend doctor. I mean, it's just it's just a community where you can go to um, and never have to feel like you're being judged or that you're the only one that's been through something like that. So I've really enjoyed um, being a part of that. So that's amazing. It's a really I was so excited to hear about this organization because I think that's where you have community. There's mm -hmm. healing. Yes. And so you're and finding out that you're not alone. Well, tell us a little bit about your story, Sarah, because so young to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Yes. So I was um, 24 at my initial diagnosis. Um, I'm a registered nurse, like you mentioned. Um, I moved here to Dallas when I first became a nurse. And um, I thought by the time I moved here, got settled in um, with my boyfriend, we were high school sweethearts. Um, I thought it was time to kind of put my own health as a priority. And um, I knew that my family had been affected by cancer um, early on. So my um, aunts both had uh, breast and reproductive cancer. Um, and then I had a cousin who was 29 years old that was diagnosed with breast cancer as well as she was you know, about to turn 30 and starting her family. And um, so then I kind of knew that cancer is in my family, but it was always kind of like a misconception. Oh, you know, cancer just loves your family or it's something, you know, like maybe where you live and things like that. And so I kind of looked into a little bit more. My family discovered that we have the BRCA1 um, gene mutation. And so I went and got tested. Um, my results came back positive. And so immediately the you know typical protocols to start screening. Um, I technically should have started, I think, at 19, 10 years before your youngest um, relative. With MRI. Yes. With a periodic MRI, not yes. mammogram, because we're not going to see with the Brent dense breast tissue. Correct. Right? Yes. And let's talk about BRCA. Just so BRCA1 mm -hmm. and BRCA2 genetic um, mutation is when you have that genetic mutation, that's the familial breast cancer can also be associated with colon cancer yes. and ovarian. But when we have that gene, we're at, you're at actually an 80% increased risk over the general population to have a diagnosis, a lifetime diagnosis of breast cancer. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so a lot of the um, breast disease community are people who choose to have preventative double mastectomies. Um, they feel empowered by that decision. So that was a decision that I was um, initially posed with, um, you know, when I initially met with a genetic counselor, which is typically the process after you're diagnosed with the uh, BRCA1 genetic mutation, is they meet with you, they talk to you about the options, um, give you the option of having a hysterectomy at such a young age. And those are a lot of things to consider when you haven't even, you know, decided if you want to start a family yet. So, um, but that's a lot of what, you know, it is, is being empowered by your decisions and your health and being able to kind of take it into your own hands. So those were the decisions I was trying to make. And then when I got the results back from my screening, I, you know, I, the decisions were kind of, you know, taken away in a sense. And so, but I, I still feel like I got to make those decisions. I got to 
Um, I went through fertility uh, preservation, so I did two rounds of that. Um, so that's also like yeah. um, egg preservation. So you had yes. a cryo, you have cryotherapy yes. for the eggs. Yeah. Yes, um, so that was a big decision to make. I mean, it was my first procedure um, that I'd ever had, so it was and a lot. And at what age were you diagnosed? 24 years 24. old. 24, and so in yes. order to do that, just for our audience, to you're injected with high levels of hormone yeah and here you have this breast cancer diagnosis and we're injecting mm -hmm. with high levels of hormone so that we can you know essentially uh, you know, retrieve eggs from your ovaries mm -hmm. and save them for when you're ready for them yes um and since my breast cancer was triple negative meaning that it does not respond to any of the hormone receptors um my oncologist didn't feel like that was that much of a risk but i was given a timeline so um i was diagnosed in november of 2018 and by the end of the year, it was, you know, we need to start chemotherapy. So um, the timeline was a little skewed, but I started January 4th. So we got to go celebrate New Year's and, you know, say this is going to be a good year. We're going to, you know, move on from this. So we did that. Um, and then I started, I had, um, you know, after the fertility preservation, which sometimes is a, a diagnosis in itself in fertility, um, you know, I then started, um, I did 16 rounds of chemotherapy. So I did, you um, Adriamycin, um, they call it the red red devil. Um, it, <laughs> so it's it's infusing in red. Um, and then I had cytoxin, um, taxol. My oncologist also um, added in carboplatin. Um, so it was just kind of all of these things. And then I met also with a dietitian beforehand to see what you could do, you know, to completely maximize the effects of these medications and make sure that also you're, you know, putting your health first um, and see what you can do there. And so I met with them. Um, and then I underwent a double mastectomy um, and I had tissue expanders um, in place. And then um, after my surgical pathology, it, I initially was diagnosed in my right breast and it moved uh, across lymphatic and to my uh, left-sided lymph nodes um, while I was undergoing all this grueling chemotherapy. Oh my and goodness, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so then I started radiation treatments. Uh, those were daily, so 33 rounds of, of radiation. Radiation locally to yes, breast to, chest and Yes, and then also axilla. the axilla and then um, and the, clavicle. the upper clavicle um, lymph nodes as well. And then, um, so I had that, you have to hold your breath. And it's kind of, it's it was like a therapy in a way. You know, you get to sit there with your thoughts for, for 30 minutes a day. And so um, it was... It was a lot just going every day for daily appointments, but um, made it through that and then had the um, final round had um, of my reconstruction surgery. So it's kind of nice. They do it with a plastic surgeon. They do um, fat grafting, which is essentially, you know, one positive thing I feel like I got out of it was liposuction at the time of the reconstruction <laughs> surgery, if there's a positive way to look at it. But um, so that and then I ended up doing six months of an oral chemotherapy. Um, my oncologist really felt like it would help to reduce my risk of a reoccurrence. So I finished that in June of this year. And here I am. And so. here you are looking yeah. healthy and radiant and Thank beautiful. You. And um, yeah. what were some of the physical consequences of the chemotherapy and radiation experience? Yeah. Um, so mainly I feel like, you know, I, I was, you know, blessed enough to not have to experience um, nausea. They give a lot of anti-emetics before um, anti-nausea medications. So I always had, and they give steroids, so I always had a really increased appetite afterwards. Um, I know with the chemotherapy treatments, a lot of um, people get nauseous and so they're not able to eat. And my main thing was I, I gained weight, um, but then I also lost a lot of muscle. Um, and then your hormones are affected. Um, I was thrown into menopause at 24 years old, um, right immediately after the, I completed the fertility treatments. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't really aren't able to speak to your regular doctors about. They're kind of mentioned at the very last or given to you in paperwork, you know, about your sexual health, your mental health. And, you know, those things are all um, something that are important to your overall health. And uh, I just feel like they weren't the, it wasn't the first thing that we talked about, you know, obviously we want to make sure that someone's healthy physically and, you know, based on their, their surgical results and everything. But, you know, those things are also important factors that sometimes are overlooked in cancer care. Now, have your, um, have you started your periods back? I, I have. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, two months ago I did. So like, yes, yay! <laughs> yes. So, um, and celebrate. yeah. So two months ago, um, started using, um, organic tampons since then. And so, you know, just things like that to, to try to, to help. I know, um, you know, it's really big go 
having a breast cancer diagnosis to use like non-toxic products, mm -hmm. um, you know, all natural. So, um, you know, just trying to make changes like that. But um, yeah, so I did and it was kind of a shock. I'm like, okay, I'm 26. I'm having a menstrual cycle, but like, what do I do now? <laughs> so um, it's it was different, um, but it, it's something that I'm thankful for. And, you know, hopefully it just means that in different ways I'm able to, to kind of move on. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and Sierra, you said you had your high school sweetheart and you've been together, you told yes. me before we started recording for 10 years. Now, yes. how has this experience grown you as a woman and in relationship and how has that affected you? It's, um, it's been difficult, but it's empowered me to be my own person. Um, I'm currently enrolled in uh, school to be a nurse practitioner. Um, so it, you know, kind of gave me prior to diagnosis, I was already leaning that direction, but it gave me you know, even more empowerment to be able to make that decision for myself and move forward to be able to help others. Um, as a woman, it, it, you know, made me realize being with my boyfriend for so long, I, I need him, but I also need myself and I need to be myself. Um, we got a dog and after our, my diagnosis. Um, so I think we both kind of needed that in a change, but, um, you know, it's just really as a woman, it kind of makes you, a lot of times it makes you feel weak. And I think one of the, the strengths that you can display from this is, is, you know, saying that you feel weak at times and you feel, um, you know, defeated at times, but that's why, you know, and he's been great through all of this. I couldn't have asked for anything more from my support from him and my family and friends, but, um, it's where kind of the, the space was filled in by the breasties that they really just get it. And you don't even have to say anything like they, um, just sit there and you just listen and, um, they do what's called a circle time. So kind of like this, but on a larger scale and, um, they just listen and they just get it. And so, you don't have to feel like um, like anything that you've gone through is is um, that you're alone in it. Even if they weren't there, they they get it and they know. And so um, it's been really great to have them. And so I think that it's something um, that that's important for anyone that's been affected by breast or reproductive cancer to know that they're here. They're, it's a social media. Um, uh, outlet that you can go to. Um, they're here to support you. They offer grants um, annually for those affected by breast and reproductive cancer. Um, anyone can be a breastie. Uh, we hope that you, Dr. Anna, will become a breastie. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So There's it's, so much we're going to do together, Sierra. Yes, it really is. Yeah. I, I know that this is an incredible mission. I think what mm -hmm. I feel so strongly is that this, you know, often we have to put on a brave face. Mm -hmm. Often we have to put on a brave face like, okay, well, you know, gosh, we've worked through this and now things are rosy and yeah. that's not how life deals us. Yeah, no, it's definitely not linear. It hasn't been. And um, I think it's kind of like, where do you go from, from here? Um, you know, a lot of times with things like that, you just, you know, feel numb. And uh, there's, you know, there's things like with, I, I was lucky enough to have great, um, you know, providers throughout my care and, um, a great um, primary doctor and, and gynecologist, I felt like, and then even meeting with the oncology gynecologist for follow-up care for my BRCA1 risk with ovarian cancer. But, um, and I feel like they've, you know, they've touched on things like that, but it's, um, it's just been, it's been difficult to go through something like this. You know, I know you, you work with a lot of women through, through menopause and things like that, um, but probably at a much older, uh, age. older age. So, um, it's just, you know, it's, it's a lot to have to go through. And, um, you know, aside from, it, it's just kind of picking up, you know, like you said, what, you know, finding the strength to do that. And so, um, and, yeah. and, um, building a strong enough foundation so mm -hmm. that you're not waiting for the next shoe to drop, right. which is something my breast cancer patients would always say. It's like, you know, when's the next shoe, when's the next mm -hmm. diagnosis, or, you know, if it's right breast, when's the left breast and, and those, those challenges that we have and always like from, I'm glad you're going into, to be a nurse practitioner, continuing yeah. your study in medicine, because getting to those root causes, I mean, it's beyond, we have the genetic expression, mm -hmm. and then we can use environment, nature yes. to overpower that genetic expression. And I just one more question for mm -hmm. you. So is there a question that you had, like in your heart that you said, gosh, I really need to, I need an answer to this, but I, I'm afraid to ask, I don't know what to ask. And, you know, I'm struggling, I know my breasty sisters are struggling mm -hmm. with, what would, what is that? So I would say the question um, that I would have asked would be, you know, had I have known, say, six months before I was diagnosed, um, you know, what can I do? What can I do to completely optimize my health, um, you know, to make sure that I have kind of like can use my body as a machine going into this and work with my body as opposed to working against it? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do to kind of armor 
myself to fully be prepared for what's about to happen because I, I you know, before, you know, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the other breasties feel this way, before you go into treatment, you know, you're healthy. You, sometimes, you know, a lot of times um, people go in because they have a lump or, um, you know, they suspect something or they have something or symptoms, but oftentimes, you know, especially at such a young age, you have no symptoms. I had two, I think two clinical breast exams before I was diagnosed and um, it, nothing was found because the breast tissue is so dense at that mm -hmm. age. So I think my main question would just be what can, what could I have done um, to try to help best prepare myself for the journey that I was about to go on. And, and it's like, what are the steps? It's never too early mm -hmm. to start. So I think like we, we teach that. I really feel strongly in working with patients too. It's that concept of what decreases our risk moving forward right. and what do we need to do now? And that's the concept, intermittent fasting. I call it keto green living, yeah. keto alkaline, right? Just low, avoiding sugars. And Mary, a mutual friend mm -hmm. of ours, was saying that, that what you brought up, it's a misconception by the media that it's weight loss with chemotherapy because mm -hmm. it's steroids and mm -hmm. nausea and can be many things and, and weight gain. And then that's an inflammatory, that's another thing on top that we have to deal with body image wise as well. And, and so like the, the support, having support around that and to be able to talk through this is really important. I think breasties do this really, really well. Yes. So, yeah. I'm so glad. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have more conversations and um, address these issues. And I'm glad you guys are doing this. So for our audience, The Breasties is this nonprofit organization. It's at thebreasties.org. And it is, check it out, refer to friends, and let people know about this organization, just supporting sister, supporting sisters through this journey. And I thank you. I thank you, Sierra, for being here today with thank me. You. I want to encourage all of you to check out thebreasties.org and donate. It's an amazing organization doing so much good. Sierra, tell us a little bit about some of the things they are doing. Yes. Yeah, so um, the Breasties, uh, like Dr. Anna mentioned, um, it's a nonprofit. They offer annual um, grants to those affected by cancer, um, breast and reproductive cancers. Um, they, prior to the pandemic, were able to offer um, you know, in-person weekend wellness retreats, um, you know, where someone who had just undergone a diagnosis or treatment could go and really just feel like so inclusive that they belong, they were not alone, and that even what they had just gone through, um, you know, th that they were able to sit there in that time and have that time to themselves and with others who understand it. Um, they also do an annual um, gala, which they have, you know, um, in a camp breasty where, um, you know, they had hosted over 500 um, people who had been uh, diagnosed or affected in some way by breast reproductive cancer. So, um, you know, any uh, donations that they get go to that. And even throughout the pandemic, they've been able to offer um, just immense virtual support, mm -hmm. which takes a lot of resources, a lot of time. And, you know, you, it's where you have to kind of focus on yourself first because you can't give from, you know, an empty, empty cup. an empty cup. So, um, you know, they've just done so much to help the community, the cancer community. Um, and so in order to help their cause, um, you can text breasties. Um, so again, we talked about some breast fund, breast best friend and breasties um so you can text breasties to 44321 to donate to their cause so text breasties to 44321 and and donate and what a great organization thank you i think there's a lot we're going to do together yes yeah <laughs> there's thank a you lot so that much. we're going to do it. thank you stay tuned we'll be right back welcome back everyone now we're going to switch to talking about implants and explants. And today my guest is Dr. Rachel Walker. She is a Dallas plastic surgeon and owner of the Plastic Surgery Center of Dallas. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm so glad to talk about this. You know, we've been dealing in October with breast health, breast cancer awareness, and there's a lot of discussion of, you know, just the physical appearance, how are we, you know, how do we do after breast surgery, if it was mastectomy, or if it was for breast biopsy, or in general, if we're postpartum mom, and we've got droopy breast, and, you know, not really sure. So I wanted to talk with you about implants, and not, then also bring up this really important discussion about explants. Yes, yes, I think they're all great topics. And the nice thing is, is Everyone has countless options when it comes to their breast, be enlarging them, lifting them, um, choosing an implant if that's right for them, using fat to modify them, or if they have an implant and they're not feeling great, taking that implant out. 
Yeah. So when you talk about using fat to modify them, yes. Well, tell us about that. Um, I think fat is a great option because you're using fat that's already in your body and everyone has some fat they want to get rid of somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and then enhancing the breast shape. What it can't do is it can't increase. You can't take someone from an A cup to a D cup. You can add some subtle fullness. It's great for breast cancer deformities. If someone has a lumpectomy and has a little divot remaining, fat is a great option there because maybe someone doesn't want an implant. Um, it often is also used with lifts because people who have stretch in their breasts over time, a lot of times they lose a lot of the upper pole fullness of their breast and they don't want an implant, but they mm -hmm. still want some roundness there so they can fit in bras and shirts better. Fat is a great option for that. I just think it's important that patients have realistic ex expectations. So it might be two to three sessions of fat grafting to help them reach their goals. But if it is a subtle thing like a divot or just a little roundness that can be done in one session. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And there's a lot of fear around implants now. Yes. A lot of discussion about, you know, the syndrome associated with breast implants. And yes, I want to bring that up because it's a real, it's a real concern. And yes. how do you know? Well, first, let's, let's stop. Let's backtrack a second. Let's talk about, you know, how implants have changed over the years. They're not the same as they were 20 years ago. Correct. And that they are safer. Right. So... Breast implants back in the 70s had no regulation around them. The FDA didn't regulate these implantable devices. And then breast implants kind of got grandfathered in once the FDA started regulating them. Well, then in 92, um, people started looking at breast implants more. And breast implant companies couldn't say that implants were safe. There was no proof that they weren't safe. But they ended up in the 90s withdrawing implants off the market for cosmetic purposes. Gel implants were still used in breast cancer patients for reconstruction, but they weren't able to be used in a breast augmentation patient. And that allowed these implant companies to do a whole bunch of studies. Like, is there a higher risk of autoimmune disorders or any type of disorder mm -hmm. with the implant? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, these studies came back and showed that breast implants had no correlation with autoimmune disease, and they were put back in the market in 2006. And ever since, they've been trying to keep up with the science and make tracking higher level. Um, and things have been going great, but then breast in implant illness came up. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of women out there who have these really nebulous constellation of some symptoms, fatigue, hair loss, low energy levels, sleeplessness, too much sleep. Uh, they're not feeling like themselves uh, and they have breast implants. And so right now, the plastic surgery societies are really trying to work on finding good data. Are there things that make people more susceptible? Mm -hmm. Is it a genetic marker? Is it something in their health history that maybe we could have picked up on and said, you're at higher risk of breast implant illness? Because if you look at most of the data, 95 to 98% of people with implants are healthy, happy, and happy with their choice. And if mm -hmm. they choose to get them removed, it might just be that they want smaller breasts. Mm -hmm. But then there's still a huge chunk of women out there that don't feel good. And mm -hmm. we need to find out why and what markers there are. Because unfortunately right now, if you look at blood tests, they're stone cold normal. Their x-rays are normal. All these lab studies are normal, which I can only imagine is incredibly frustrating for the patient. Um, is there an increase in Hashimoto's or autoimmune disease in these so clients that have these symptoms? If there's not a good study that shows that, so there is a study that shows no, people with breast implants don't get diagnosed at a higher rate of Hashimoto's, but now we're trying to work from a different level and look, the patients who get implants who have Hashimoto's, or maybe they have something else going on in their health history that could have set an alarm off for us. Maybe the breast implants aren't right for you. Maybe mm -hmm. it will tip your inflammatory mechanisms in your body to a level you can't tolerate mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, that is kind of where the research is going, I think. Not, not that the implant causes the Hashimoto's, but maybe it makes your genetic susceptibility tip a little bit and then your Hashimoto's comes out because you were more susceptible than someone else. Yeah. Um, but they're doing a whole implant registry now so they can track and bring back patients. And luckily, patients are very willing to be part of the registry and have these symptoms tracked because we want to know, like, are there people that just... Yeah. aren't right for implants. Right, right. I think that's important. And also just looking at the toxicity level, like if we can see phthalates in the blood, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, plastics or PCBs or whatever it may be, if we can start tracking that in the blood or the urine, right, and then we can see, okay, how is this increasing over time, maybe baseline, and then periodic, that may be a nice thing to add into the studies. Right. Um, and there is a very smart plastic surgeon out of St. Louis, Patricia McGuire. Yeah. And she 
has really made this her baby, tracking all of these things. And she's very tight with people in the breast implant illness community because those are the things we want to know about. But I don't think at this point anyone in the plastics world really thinks that it's one, like everybody gets higher levels of X if yeah. you get breast implants. But there are probably certain markers in a certain patient that they can't tolerate a foreign body in their body, or maybe mm -hmm. their body is more sensitive, or maybe they had a higher level and we've just pushed them over. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be very interesting when the study is completed. Yeah. And I'm curious too, because you think, okay, well, what would create a leaching of the plastics, right? right. And then I think from my perspective, it's that alcohol, that acidity, mm -hmm. you know, like having high inflammation, high stress, right. and that is that a part of it? And these are just things we just don't know. Right. And I think that's why I was so interested in coming on your podcast, actually, because I think all your work is fantastic. And I think people look at health really one dimensionally a lot of times, but there's a lot of things that need to be done to have a healthy body, have healthy balance of things. And we'll meet these patients who have had breast implants for 15 years and they felt fine. And then all of a sudden they started feeling sick, but mm -hmm. maybe something tipped them over. Maybe they're getting chemicals in other part of their body like diet or mm. cosmetics they use or hair products they use. And then the implants just aren't helping things anymore. And the implants get taken out and they feel better. But unfortunately right now we don't have enough research to always promise somebody. I can't tell them your implants going to come right. out and you're going to feel great. So let's talk about cos cosmetically and too, like no shame in like saying our breasts are part of our femininity. We want to own, okay, the way they are. That's yeah. amazing. I have four daughters. So, yeah. you know, at, at all ages right now. And so I always get the questions, mom, are mine different? Mine are different than others. <laughs> One's different than the other. My daughters are going to kill me right yeah. now. You know, like what, what do we do about this? I'm like, just wait it out. Yes. Wait, stay healthy. Let's work on these things yes. and you'll see it'll even out over time. And I yes. think we had uh, a beautiful lady, uh, Dana Donofrey from um, Anna Ono, who does the bras and just like non-binding non bras, yeah. even for women who have had implants or mastectomies. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, there's, um, there's such a, um, uh, I would say image issue sometimes when mm -hmm. you're dealing with the concept of inserting breast implants or having reductions. And right. so what type of counseling goes around that? I think it's really important that the patient is clear about their goals and is reminded that everybody's different. Everybody looks different. And breasts are sisters, not twins. There is no one who has two twin breasts. <laughs> I like that. Um, and I think people get wound up in their own asymmetries and tend to just really focus in on something because they see their own body every day. Mm -hmm. And I always like to re reassure my patients, like, you are normal because everyone is normal. There are people who have congenital disorders where one breast is tremendously bigger than the other and they can't wear bras, or people who have really large breasts and they get chest, back, and neck pain. And then there's, I mean, the garden variety breast augmentation patient who just wants to look different in clothes. I feel great doing that augmentation because they have made this decision. Mm -hmm. They don't feel bad about themselves. They just made a conscious decision to change something about their body. Is their body, they get to do something with it. Um, but I get nervous when patients come in and they say like, I feel abnormal or I feel like I would be better if this change was made because I feel like there's usually something else going on there, um, or they're just being too hard on, the, on themselves. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I see hundreds of breasts a month. And I mean, they come in all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and they're all glorious. All beautiful, <laughs> exactly. I'm with you, all yeah. beautiful, you know? And, yeah. and and I think it's important to embrace that, like yeah. that just are, you know, really to accept that because often, and you've seen it too, if it's, it's the breast and then it's the abdomen and then it's the, you know, yeah neck it's the you know i mean it's yeah. ankles i mean just one thing after the other and and that's a challenge and i know i think one of my favorite phrases were that stretch marks are tiger stripes you earn them and there's so <laughs> many people that beat up on themselves for things that happen with aging gravity works aging happens it's great to get older but if you want to make well thought out decisions to change your appearance more power to you but I don't think you should sit there looking in the mirror just feeling bad because someone else has a better neck. Well, maybe you have better kneecaps. There you go. There <laughs> you, you don't go. know. Yeah. I, I think like one of the programs I have is called Sexual CPR. And I say the ABCs of Sexual CPR, like you have ABCs of CPR. Yeah. So it's like accept, accept yourself. Yes. Accept where you are right now. Like to feel sexy, just yeah. accepting 
all your uniqueness, right? Yes. Your imperfections, perfectly imperfect. And that's a really big one. The B is be present. Yeah. And so, and then C is communicate. So I think it's too like saying, hey, you know, I, what we had on just uh, before you came on, Sierra from the Breasties yeah. and the concept of communicating with others. So you're like, you're not alone. Yes. You're yes. not alone. And I love the comment. Look, your breasts are sisters, not identical twins. Yes, they are not. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. And so where do you feel like there's that line, like someone is, you know, there, there's that person who is, is on that threshold. You're not sure, like, this is the right decision for them. How do you counsel and coach? So for me, it's important to have a long initial consultation with my patient. I don't believe in meeting my patient the day of surgery or anything like that, because I want to, I want to hear about their goals. Because Everyone's idea of beauty is different for one reason. And two, they need to have realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so one 25-year-old could walk in my door and only need a breast augmentation to help her reach her goals and she'll be happy. The next 25-year-old could walk into my door and maybe she needs a breast lift, even though she's never had kids. But she wants something changed with her breast, but she's not really sure how to get there. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And then someone else might just be unhappy because they're unhappy about something else in their life and they think it's because of their breast and they just really haven't dove do. deep. Um, ASPS, one of the Plastic Surgery Societies, just released a questionnaire that's kind of trying to help people really mentally think about breast augmentation more. Because I think there's a lot of people out there who just don't think cosmetic surgery is surgery, but it is surgery. You're going to sleep and you're making a surgical modification to your body. And breast augmentation is quick and generally, like, you can get it scheduled pretty quick. So I think some people look at it kind of like Botox, even though it's very different. And so if you make them sit down with a six page questionnaire about your goals and like, these are the risks of breast surgery, or these are the potential hurdles you might have to jump over, or in 15 years, you might have to have them replaced. Right. Um, it makes it a more informed decision by the patient. And I think just helps with the overall recovery process and selecting the right patient. So you mentioned having them replaced. So let's yeah. talk about this because this is one of those issues that like, oh my gosh, once you have them in, you never want to replace them or if you're going to have them out, just get them out. And then what does that look like if you don't choose to replace right. them? So oh. implants, like, there's this huge myth out there and I don't know why it's still perpetuated that you have to get your implants replaced every 10 years. That's not true. But what is true is your implant warranty lasts 10 years. Ah. Um, so if you had a rupture prior to 10 years, most implant companies will pay for part of your surgery and get you new implants. Um, after 10 years, if your implants are just fine, keep them and just check in with your plastic surgery surgeon regularly. The FDA now recommends every three years getting an ultrasound to make sure your shell's intact, which is nice because up until a, ma a month ago, they recommended MRI, which was kind of difficult for patients to get. It was mm -hmm. cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing for me is if you think about 15 years, your implant should last you 15 years you're going to be a little different place in your life. Maybe you want to go bigger. Maybe you want them out, which is a great question. What happens when I get mm -hmm. them out? If you pick an implant that fits your body size, which is different for everybody, what an 800cc implant looks on, like on me versus someone who's six foot two is very different. Right. Versus an 800 on a five foot one person probably won't fit. Mm -hmm. But if you pick something body appropriate, the aging of the breast is not going to change that much. And so presuming your breast ages well, which everybody's different, um, your breast is going to look pretty good with an implant out. It's just not going to be as full. But that's why push-up bras are made if you want to change that. <laughs> there you go. So removing the implant can still like... You can still have a beautiful, beautiful breast. Beautiful breast. Um, I think mentally it can be tough in the first two weeks because there's some little divots and sometimes the breast will suck up a little bit and it will look a little deformed. But over time, that skin tissue envelope will shrink mm -hmm. back up kind of like a pregnant belly. Mm -hmm. And then the breast tissue will fluff out a little bit because over time with compression on the breast tissue, it does get a little compressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you take that implant out, it will fluff back out. So people are generally pretty surprised how pretty their breasts are. Um, and that's assuming you liked your breasts before augmentation, you just wanted them bigger. Mm -hmm. But if you have some of the other aging problems, like maybe you had a couple of pregnancies with your implants and your breasts drooped a lot and fell off your implant, you're probably going to need something else if you want them up in a normal posture. More but of a lift. With more of a end. lift. Mm -hmm. And it's still a pretty breast mm -hmm. remaining. It is very rare someone needs an implant to have a classically pretty breast, but... I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's great. That is yeah. good. And then if a woman does want to have her, like if she's worried about breast implant syndrome, yes. what should she do? 
So I think meeting with a plastic surgeon is first and foremost, like get that conversation started because I think it's mentally stressful for one thinking something inside your body is poisoning you. And that's not like, that's something we need to start the conversation mm -hmm. with. And maybe you are the person who cannot tolerate a foreign body and you need it out. And so the plastic surgeon is going to be the one taking it out. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important to not be short-sighted. We don't want to miss something else. We don't want to miss like a parathyroid problem just because there is a breast implant and there's a lot of social media um, excitement around breast implant illness that I think for me, the biggest fear is someone missing something more important because they Another want it to be their breast something. implant. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is if you take a breast implant out, like it doesn't affect you much. I mean, it is like if I felt sick and I had a breast implant and I couldn't figure out what's wrong, I'd try taking my breast implant out. It's mm -hmm. a very definable step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just important to have the conversation, make sure your other health, um, health is in line. Like, is your diet okay? Are you getting good sleep? Do you have anything else going on in your life? Because it could be multifactorial and we don't want to just hone in too much on one thing. You've done a number of explant surgeries too. And yes. do you feel like, um, have you seen anything like mold issues or finding a rupture, like surprises when you've done it? I've never found mold. Um, I found problems with the capsule. So that's just the scar your body forms around the implant that can get thick and it can get thick from a variety of reasons. So maybe there was an infection at some point and your scar tissue just overformed. Mm -hmm. And that I think can cause inflammation because it's thick and it kind of tugs on your breast tissue mm -hmm. and taking that capsule out might relieve some of that. Mm -hmm. um, lymphatic flow, right? Yes. Because for the lymphatics. Okay. Yes. And then those ruptured implants, I, oftentimes I'll go in and find a ruptured implant that I didn't necessarily know was ruptured, but the patient wanted to change them out anyways or take them out. So we didn't have to get any further studies. I do think having a ruptured implant changes how your capsule reacts around the implant because the shape of the implant will change over several years. Mm -hmm. And that might trigger more inflammation. It might trigger some kind of change in your body. So getting mm -hmm. that out is best. Right. I think patients who I put an implant back in and maybe they had breast pain as their original complaint, they tend to feel better, but also patients who just want them out, hopefully better. they feel better. <laughs> and so, I mean, such a good point. So if someone's wondering, should they go for a breast ultrasound mm -hmm. to look? And would you be able to see a capsular rupture mostly on a breast ultrasound? Most of the time, there are limitations, which the nice thing is, is like ultrasound technology has improved so much over the past decade uh, that they are really seeing most structures with an ultrasound. If it's inconclusive, you still might end up in an MRI. But if it's important, that makes sense. But a screening MRI every three years was not very feasible for most people. So if you could do a screening ultrasound every three years, and you can see most quadrants of the breast implant, except in people with very large breasts to begin with, who just wanted to make them larger. It's mm -hmm. hard to see through all of that. Mammograms also will pick them up sometimes. It's not a good screening modality for rupture. But I mean, I have a lot of patients who come in, their mammogram told them they had a rupture. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. All right. So I want to thank you so much for spending time today. I do have one more question yes. for you. So what is your favorite plastic surgery procedure to perform? I don't even know if I have a favorite right now because I went into plastics because you get to do so much. And it's just so fun to partner with a patient on a journey. And I feel like my favorite is just getting to know the patient long term. So you meet them and join them on this journey for maybe subtle tweaks they want to make or just to get to know them, but yeah. um, I love mommy makeovers. I just think it's a fun journey to be on with a patient and um, that's a little more straightforward and why patients come in for it, but it's all fun. It's all fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you're lovely. You're ah. lovely. I'd like you to be my plastic surgeon. So, <laughs> so much fun. So Dr. Rachel Walker from Dallas Plastic Surgery Center right here in Dallas. So really a pleasure. Thank you for sharing Thank your you. information and time Thank you. with us today. It was a pleasure. <laughs> well, we will be right back. Well, I'm back in the hot seat to readdress this question about implant explant. And I know we dove deep into discussion here and it may leave you with even more questions. And then this is where it's important to understand what is happening with your body using your intuition 
and being very proactive in your health. You're putting your best health and self-care as a priority in your life. This is critically important. And whether you've had implants or not, whether you've had a diagnosis of breast cancer or not, you have a family history, all of us have to keep the healthiest temple of our spirit that we absolutely can. And it, it, starts, it starts from the ground up. And if you have questions, you know where to ask, right? I am here for you. So don't hesitate. Visit me you know, at dranna.com, my website, on my show page. There is a place where you can type in a question and we can dig even deeper. At my dranna.com, the show notes for this episode are there with the resources and links to the Breasties, to Dr. Rachel and Dr. Kieran, and additional resources for you as well. So remember, I am here for you. It is about embracing your whole health, right? Nourishing your body, awakening to what is possible for you and shining from the inside out and embracing, embracing your health, embracing loving relationships and connection. Those are the four pillars here at the Girlfriend Doctor that we build the foundation of whole health on. And remember, when you have your health, you have a million wishes. And when you don't have your health, you only have one wish, right? To have your health. So I want that for all of you. And as we enter this season of gratitude and giving, I want you to know that you are not alone. We're walking this journey together and I am here for you. Till next time, see you soon. <music>